il vecchio del microfono. Ok. Poi lanciare il... È lanciato. È, è lanciato, ok, perfetto. Il vecchio del microfono, però. Ok, si sì, chiede. Sì, lo lanciamo, sì, lo salvo, sì, 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 sì. Lasciamo la luce c'è di spinta. Uh, sì, prego. Okay. Così? Così va meglio? Sì, sì, così va meglio. Va Okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, I hope you had a nice lunch break in the car, eager to hear some more science. So, we have three talks in the afternoon session um, and also a mix of academic and industry perspectives. So the first two speakers will be online, and then we have one uh, talk in the afternoon, also on site. But I'm very happy to announce the first talk, so this will be given by Jacob Hoytis um, on uh, progress in end-to-end -end learning for the physical layer, and we are looking very much forward to your talk. Yeah, hello everybody, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I wished I could be with you in uh, Lake Como, but I'm back in my apartment in Paris and it would, would have been simply too stressful to come since the school is starting uh, this week and two of my kids have changed school and so I need to be there. So I hope for your understanding. Um, yeah, so um, um, since I, there's nothing about photonics in my talk, so, but I hope you can get something out of it. So I wasn't quite sure about um, the background of, of the audience. So I tried to make it fairly general and high level so that I um, can get the key messages across and it stays um, understandable for anyone. But if you have detailed questions and you have some you know, expert knowledge on the topics, feel also free to ask questions at, at any time. Yeah, so I am I'm a, a principal research scientist at NVIDIA based in Paris. Um, and prior to that, um, I worked at uh, Nokia Bell Laboratories on um, 5G research for, for wireless um, communications. I have a PhD in applied um, mathematics, um, during which I looked a lot at uh, information theory, information theoretic bounds for very large systems. And in 2017, I, I decided to change a bit the um, orientation of my research, and I looked into the um, intersection of, of machine learning and in particular um, deep learning um, for signal processing on the, on the physical layer for wireless communication systems. And um, I am particularly interested in the idea of end-to-end -end learning, um, in which I've worked for the last yeah, five years. And I hope to bring you this idea a bit, um, yeah, explain you this idea, the key concepts and what has happened during the last five years, what's the state of the art of this field today. Good. Um, okay. Let me start with um, the fundamental problem of communications, as it was um, defined by Claude Shannon in 1948, which is that of um, reproducing at one point either exactly or approximately a message that has been selected at another point. And that's, of course, a fairly um, extract um, definition. Um, and the way we typically look at this is, of course, through a mathematical model um, that looks as follows. So we have a transmitter, which would like to communicate one out of M messages through a channel to a receiver. Um, and the channel is simply a conditional um, distribution function, P of Y given X, where Y is what you observe and X is what you what you've, um, feed into the channel. Um, so for now, x is a real valued um, vector of n dimensions, and n is sometimes called um, the number of channel uses. The transmitter has a power constraint because you can't um, you know, radiate uh, energy with infinite power. So typically, we assume that um, um, the, the average um, power of x is equal to 1 per channel use. And then the um, receiver so observes y and needs to predict which of the M messages has been sent. So this is S hat. And the goal of a well-designed communication system is to minimize probability of making an error, right? So that's, that's the communication problem as it actually also appeared in Shannon's first paper. Now, um, this is not something, of course, you can implement in practice. Um, let's have a look at how we design um, communication systems actually today. The first thing um, is that you 
start with a channel, say, what is the channel which I would like to communicate? Is this a wireless channel? Is this an optical fiber? Is this underwater acoustics? Is this mole molecular communication channels and something like this? Then you start doing channel measurements and try to derive a channel model. So a mathematical description of what's going on. Um, sometimes you have stochastic channel models. You would need to have a, uh, actually a, a way to draw random realizations um, of your channel. Um, that you can then work with. And once you have a channel model, um, you can start doing some hard thinking and come up with algorithms um, that you would implement in the transmitter and receiver side. And typically we do not communicate one out of M messages, we communicate bits, right? So we have a uh, vector, a binary representation of something that we want to um, get across the channel. Now um, the drawbacks of this approach, are that any, I would say any, any real physical model is, is intractable and we need to find a compromise between tractability and um, the degree of realism. So for example, in wireless, we often ignore hardware impairments or we, and, or we assume that um, there are a lot of algorithm in place that compensate for all of the non-linearities you might have in such a system. And so then we make this ideal um, assumption that uh, for example, hardware impairments do not exist. Um, but despite whatever you do, there's always a residual mismatch between the channel model and the actual channel model over which you can communicate. And um, apart from that, it means essentially you design algorithms for this idealized channel model, and so they can never be fully optimal. Um, the other drawback is that um, in many cases, we are able to derive optimal um, algorithms they are just too complex to put in a, in, for example, in a, in a uh, wireless device, in a handheld um, device where you have heavy constraints on um, you know, the allowable complexity and power consumption. And so you need to also find the drawbacks there between complexity and um, performance. Um, but let's zoom a little bit deeper now into each of these boxes. And there are further simplifications done. So as engineers, we are used to decompose a complex problem by splitting it into many smaller sub-problems, which we then try to solve close to optimality. And um, for example, in communications, um, where for example, we get a, um, a binary vector that we want to communicate. And the first thing we do is we introduce some kind of redundancy through channel coding. Then you have modulation, then you need to insert, for example, pilot tones that will allow you to estimate the channel impulse response at the receiver. Um, you have pulse shaping that will actually um, design um, the waveform or the spectral and temporal characteristics of what you're radiating with your antenna. And then in the receiver, you undo all of these things. You have a matched filter, you detect pilots, you estimate the channel, you demodulate what has been sent, and finally you have a um, channel decoder that allows you to recover the information bit. Now, the, um, the problem with this approach, while it's really robust and we owe, uh, for example, the 5G systems and Wi-Fi we have today to this approach is that um, these blocks are individually optimized um, often for specific, for their own metrics. So for example, if you think about channel estimation, you optimize your channel estimation algorithm to minimize the mean squared error between your estimate and the actual channel realization. But you do not care actually about how well this channel estimator works. What you care about, what is the bit error rate I get at the output of my receiver. So ultimately, you do not really know how does the improved channel estimation quality translate into improved bit error rate. And so it would be actually much nicer to optimize all of these blocks jointly together for a single end-to-end -end performance metric. Um, there are also many cases in which this um, block-based processing is suboptimal. For example, if you deal with very short um, messages, so if you just have maybe a few tenth or hundreds of information bits, it's actually not, um, not so efficient to, to insert pilot tones, have uh, preamble signals for, for synchronization and so on. You could actually um, communicate things much more efficiently if you would do this um, in, in one step. Okay. Um, there was just um, a couple of, a bit of intro. And I would like to um, uh, make some more general comments about what's the benefit or value of machine learning and particular deep learning for communications. And these are the questions that I asked myself um, in 2017 when I decided that I wanted to work uh, in this field. 
Um, by the way, this is Claude Shannon here. And um, so in many cases, we know the channel capacity. So meaning what is the, you know, the highest rate at which we communicate with uh, essentially making no error. And we know that our systems we have today are very, very close to these limits. So meaning that there is only little room for improvement. Um, on top of this, um, we deal, you know, we design the signals we send, uh, we know the channels. And so since we design everything, um, we have good models. And so typically machine learning shines when you do not have a model. And so um, there's also this question of, okay, actually why, why do we need actually an, um, such an approach if, if we can design and control almost everything? Then there are a couple of reasons why it might actually be a good idea. Um, the first is that I said at the beginning, the models we have are not always um, so, so, so good. So typically we assume that they are Gaussian, stationary and linear, which is hardly the case in practice. Um, we have this limiting functional block structure. So we have this chain of blocks where an end-to-end -end optimized systems. And lastly, if you think about how these algorithms are implemented in an ASIC or a PGA, or maybe even on a GPU or CPU, um, they, you cannot always benefit from the hardware architecture fully. And a neural network, if you are able to represent your algorithm as a neural network, it's actually very easy to exploit parallelization gains um, of, your, of your hardware. And this might lead actually to more efficient um, implementation. So thinking about, apart from performance benefits, it might actually be possible to implement algorithms with the same performance, but in a much more efficient and hardware-friendly way. And one um, sign um, that this might indeed be the case is, for example, that um, Qualcomm announced at the beginning of this year that the new um, 5G chip has an um, essentially a neural network accelerator for some of these use cases. And this is, I think, that's the one, one the first company um, doing this, but I think there are many other companies that, that will deploy and develop such um, um, essentially AI accelerators in the future. So in 2017, I think it was not so clear that this is happening, but I think now um, companies realize that there are indeed benefits to it. Good. Um, I think it's also something you might not be, you might not have heard about, um, but I think I wanted to mention it. So um, 3GPP is an organization um, that is responsible for the standardization of, of, of 4G, 5G, and also 6G in the future. And um, so right now, you, many, many of you might have uh, 5G phones, but there will be a um, something called 5G Advanced or the release 18. Um, and right now, um, there are many study groups that work on many improvements. And there's, for the first time, now one study item. It's in the top right corner, and it, I hope you can see it. It's called the AI slash ML, so Artificial Intelligence slash Machine Learning Air Interface. So that's a physical layer. There's a study item specifically on the use of um, machine learning in the physical layer. And um, so that's very important because the outcome of this study will actually determine largely to which extent um, machine learning will play a role in the physical layer um, from now on in the future. And um, so I just wanted to, to show you what this study item is actually about. So it's about exploring the benefits of augmenting the air interface. So the air interface is really the physical layer, the algorithms um, that be, you know, be decide what you transmit um, over the air. Um, so how, um, how they can be augmented with features that enabling the improved support of AML based algorithms for enhanced performance or reduced complexity. And so this will lay the foundation for future interfaces, use cases leveraging AI ML. And so there are all of the big players are there, more than 50 companies, Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, Qualcomm, uh, Nvidia, um, and many others. And um, the way this works, it says they've identified a few very specific use cases for example, um, how can we compress channel state information? So the, the estimated channel um, impulse response, can we compress this more efficiently um, with neural network techniques such as autoencoders? Or can we predict the channel state better using machine learning methods? And um, another use case is about localizing users. So you observe a radio signal that's transmitted maybe by your, uh, by your smartphone, and then you use the received um, radio signal to localize the user in, 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 in 3D um, dimensions. Um, so if you're, any of you is interested, 
you click on this link in the slide and you can access to, I think, more than a few hundred documents where all of the companies have provided some ideas and the initial results of some of these use cases. Okay, um, with uh, this intro in mind, um, I want to now to come back um, actually to the question of whether we can learn to communicate or not. And that's actually what I refer to as end-to-end -end learning. So, um, and the one way you can learn to communicate is by interpreting a communication system as an auto encoder. So if you think about it, you have bits coming into your system and bits coming out of your system. And ideally, the output would be equal to the input. And in machine learning, such a system is called an auto encoder. Um, here we have essentially the transmitter as the first part of your neural network. Then you have a penalty layer, which is essentially your channel. So this doesn't have any trainable parameters, it just does something with your, what you're transmitting. And then you have the second part of your neural network is the receiver. And um, now if you optimize such an autoencoder from end to end, you can define a one, a single um, loss metric. For example, in our case, it would be um, the information rate. I will explain in a few minutes what's meant by this. And you can jointly optimize transmitter and receiver that are optimized for a specific um, channel model um, with respect to this um, loss function. And you can do this by back propagation and stochastic gradient descent. Um, and that's a fairly universal approach because um, you can apply this to any differentiable channel model. That doesn't need to be wireless. It's in any, any mathematical equations you can write that you, for which you can compute a, um, a gradient, you can use it. And um, you can use this also to train essentially any part of the transmitter and receiver. So meaning as long as everything is differentiable, you can mix um, traditional algorithms and neural network components as you wish. Um, so as, and I will speak about um, um, differentiable programming also a bit later in my talk. Okay, good. Now um, I just wanted to make um, an information theoretic interpretation of what's going on when you train such an autoencoder. Okay, so let's start with um, channel capacity. Or so keep in mind that we have a message we want to transmit. Um, that's actually what's actually transmitted is then X. So that's the message representation our transmitter sends and receive Y. Now the mutual information between X and Y depends only on the channel. So it doesn't um, really depend on, on X and Y themselves. It really only depends on, on the channel and the, yeah, and the, and the if you want, the, the input distribution P of X. And um, Claude Shannon proved that any information rate is achievable if you can find a sequence of codes um, that as the block lengths, so the number of messages you want, if it goes to infinity, um, that you actually, that the error of making an error goes to zero. That means that you can achieve an, a communication rate. And um, the mutual information is the highest achievable information rate for a given um, channel distribution, P of Y given X, and for a given input distribution. And if you're now able to also maximize or control this input distribution, P of X, then you end up with the channel capacity. So the channel capacity is simply the maximum mutual information where you maximize with respect to P of X, okay? Now, this is not something we can really achieve in practice because in practice, we do something else. We rely on bit metric decoding. And the key idea behind bit metric decoding is the following. So you, I give you a vector of bits B, we have N bits. These are then mapped to a vector of complex valued um, constellation symbols. These are then um, essentially um, pulse shaped or um, transmitted through a channel. You receive them and you demodulate them back. But the important part is that you will get at the output of your system for every bit i one posterior probability. So P of B Y, P of B I given Y. And that's what's called by bit metric decoding. So what matters is you feed in a vector of bits and that the output you get for every bit um, a probability that it's zero and one, which is independent of all of the others. It only depends on Y. And um, 
that's important because these bit metrics, this is what you feed into a um, channel decoder. So they all operate on, on these bit metrics. Okay. And um, now comes back this um, quantity R that I mentioned earlier. That's defined as follows. Looks a bit um, frightening, but it's actually fairly simple. So we have two terms here, a, a sum over the bitwise mutual information. So I of bi given y is the mutual information between the bits i and the entire um, output y, which is a vector, and you sum them all together. And the second term is um, the kullback lightly divergence between the true bitwise posterior distribution. That's something you typically do not know, right? You ideally would like that you could compute this, but in practice, um, you always can only you can only get an approximation of it. So this is p of hat. So that's typically p of hat of b i given y is that what your receiver algorithms um, compute, and p of b i given y is what it should be. And if you had a perfect receiver, it means this penalty term, so this Kullback light by divergence would be zero, and you would only be um, left with this um, sum of the bitwise mutual information. Okay. Um, but in practice, so we never have a perfect receiver. And therefore, you can interpret the second term at the rate loss that you have because you have a mismatched receiver. OK? And it turns out that this rate, R, that this is something you can really achieve in practice with a, a state-of-the-art channel code. So if you take, for example, an um, low-density parity check code that's, for example, used in, in 5G, and if the, the length of a code word is sufficiently large, for example, 8,000 bits, um, you are very close um, to this information rate and you get no error, essentially no error anymore. Okay, so it means that this, this quantity R is actually a very good um, kind of estimate of what rate you could achieve if you had a very good channel code. And I'll explain later why this now is as important as quantity R. Okay, in general, R is smaller than the mutual information. So it's smaller than channel capacity because it, you know, it's the sum of the bitwise mutual information. And this is actually smaller than if I would write the mutual information between the entire vector B and Y. But in practice, this gap is fairly small. So it's a fraction of a dB and we don't, we don't care. Now, the reason why this quantity R here is so important is the following. Um, because it's very related to the binary cross entropy. So the binary cross entropy is simply the, expect, the, the expectation of the negative logarithm of the posterior probabilities that my receiver outputs. And one can show with a bit of math that this is equal to the number of bits minus R. So in other ways, this quantity R is the binary cross entropy minus the number of bits. And that means that minimizing the binary cross entropy is equivalent to maximizing this achievable rate R. And why is minimizing the binary cross entropy so important? I think that's fairly obvious. You know, you need to think about your receiver is a neural network that produces for every bit that has been sent one probability. So it's essentially a, a real value or to which you apply a sigmoid um, activation function. And it solves essentially n binary classification tasks in parallel. So that's how you can think about what the receiver does. And if you now look some the binary cross entropies between you know, what has been sent and what the receiver think it has sent for every bit, when you sum them all together, this is the binary cross entropy. And that's something you can easily estimate by Monte Carlo sampling, meaning I transmit a batch of um, known vectors of bits. I look at the output of my receiver. I can compute the cross entropy um, for this batch. And I use this as an approximate estimate of the true binary cross entropy. And then now I essentially um, Minimize, so the goal of training my end-to-end -end system is now minimizing the binary cross entropy because this will maximize the achievable rate. And we know that 
once the system is trained and I use a strong channel code on top, I will achieve actually the rate for which I've, the system has been trained. So it's something I can really um, use in practice. Okay, so just to summarize it again. So we have a neural network, the transmitter with parameter theta t. Um, the receiver is a neural network with parameter theta r. Um, bits come in for every bit, you get one a posterior probability out of your neural network. Sometimes they are also called log likelihood ratios um, or logits, if you want. Um, we estimate the binary cross edge dependence in the output of your system. And then we do stochastic gradient descent to optimize um, the parameters of your receiver and the transmitter. And now there's one important part in order to be able to do it, you need to be able to compute the Jacobian matrix of your channel, meaning you need to know how would y change if I change x a tiny bit. And so that means if you would try to do this over the air or with, a, um, with an actual, you know, you transmit things over an actual channel, you couldn't do it because you do not know exactly um, a channel transfer function. But um, there are ways you can estimate this Jacobian matrix, and this works very well. But I won't explain in my talk today how this, how this goes. So for, for now, we assume that um, you can always, you have a differential with channel model. But so that you know, if it's not differentiable, you can also estimate it, and the same techniques can be applied. OK, and now to make this a bit hopefully more clear, uh, I wanted to show you an example, a very simple one. So we have what is called a single input, single output system, SISO over an AWGN, so additive white Gaussian noise channel, meaning I feed in x, and what I observe is x plus n, where n is complex Gaussian noise, 0 mean variance sigma square. In our case, I have just chosen b to be a vector of size 4, meaning I transmit four bits of information, and I just have a single um, Channel, channel use here. So in other words, we have 16 different messages. And what the transmitter learns here is um, a complex valued constellation of 16 points. And the receiver observes, so this complex number y and produces four real numbers, one for each bit. And now I have a video that has been done by a young PhD student with whom I've worked a lot at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. And I hope that I can um, now share um, another screen Let's here. Um, share. Um, can you do you now see one screen or two screens? One yeah, screen. One. <laughs> Good. Okay. So um, this video is super nice, but it also contains a lot of things. And so I want to walk you slowly through it so that you understand what's going on. So top left figure, this is what essentially this constellation the transmitter learns. So you see 16 points. And on next to each point, you see the bit label. So the binary representation of what this point corresponds to. So this is a complex number, right? So there are 16 in total. And what the um, transmitter is learning is where to place these 16 points such that the average power you have in this constellation is equal to 1. On the right-hand side, you see this essentially this rate r as a function of the noise power or the signal-to-noise ratio. So if you are higher to the right, meaning the noise power is smaller in dB scale. What you see in blue this light blue color, this is Shannon capacity, meaning there is no point above this line possible. And then there are many, many other, many other curves. And um, the one curve um, which is interesting is this, um, yeah, this dark purple color uh, curve. I think that's the one I'm showing with my mouse pointer. And that corresponds to a very good baseline, which is called 16. Quam. So essentially, the, the 16 points are arranged on a, um, on a square, if you want. OK, that's called 16 quam. And where you then use an optimal um, maximum or posteriori receiver that for this channel model you can trivially derive. And um, so that's something that you would use in practice in the commercial system today. And then you have um, in this light purple, so this is this line here. This is what you would get with the constellation that is shown on the left-hand side. 
And this will develop, this will change. Actually, so this constellation is what we, what we learn, and this will move along. But if you had the optimum receiver for this constellation, then you would get this light purple curve. And then you have a curve that we can't really see. This is the orange curve, the outer encoder. At the moment, it's zero. This is what you get when you also learn the receiver. So in other case, um, this um, purple, this light purple line here, this is assuming you had the perfect receiver. And in orange is what you get with the learned receiver. And um, now you will, I will show you now a video where these things evolve over time as the training progresses. And you can see how the constellation changes and also how the um, rate behaves. And then on the top, uh, on the bottom of this um, figure, you have four um, figures. And these correspond to the decision region for each of these four bits. So essentially, you observe a complex number. And now you, the neural receiver needs to assign a probability to each of the four bits. And um, essentially, you see now the decision regions for these four bits, for what you observe, where the um, a dark um, with a purple means it's a one and the blue means it's a zero. And um, yeah, and they decision region, this is essentially what the receiver will learn. So on the top left, you see that the, point the transmitter learns where to place the points and the receiver will actually learn the optimum decision region. And now I, we start the training with this, everything is randomly initialized here. And um, now we see what's happening. So you see that these points start to move across. Also, the orange curve here is coming up because the receiver actually learns something. And um, what will happen at some point is, um, is that our transmitter now clusters these points together. So I stop here now. So essentially, right now, it, had, it, had, it has created clusters of points where always four bits are essentially merged together meaning in total, I have only two bits left that I can distinguish. And these are the first bit and the second bit. So you see these decision regions, all zeros on the top right corner, all ones bottom left corner. And for the second bit is actually um, just a mirrored version of it. Um, now, of course, we are actually worse with respect to so this baseline we try to, um, we try to beat. And um, now let's see what happened as the training um, progresses. So now um, our system has learned that it can actually um, separate out um, these constellation points a bit more. Now we have essentially eight clusters with two bits each. So meaning we can now distinguish um, eight bits. So we have the first, the second, um, and I think it's the, it's the third bit that we can distinguish. Weight is a bit higher, still not optimum. And um, now as the training um, progresses, you can imagine that um, um, the transmitter will also now learn to um, spread these 16 points out a bit more in an optimized manner. By the way, this is an, the first, the four points is called the QPSK constellation. And this one is known as a, um, um, an, um, a phase shift keying. So you have eight points uniformly distributed along the unit circle. Um, yeah, I should have accelerated the video a bit. It's not much time left. OK, now you can see that the Transmitter GNOME has decided to move one point from each cluster closer to the center. And now for the first time, if you look at the top right corner, we actually beat our baseline at this one SNR point. And you can also see that our learned system at this SNR point is as good as the optimum um, receiver. Okay, maybe I, I stop here now. Um, okay, so this is um, was just a very simple example um, that, that, that shows you that you can do this type of end-to-end -end learning for a very simple channel model. Um, in, in, in practice, um, that's called um, co geometric constellation shaping, but it's fairly widely used, in, especially in optical um, communications, but people don't typically don't use machine learning for it. Um, but the nice thing is, that we know that for the simple case, this approach converges to the optimum solution. It was not so clear um, that this actually works because it's a non-convex um, problem. 
And now the idea is, of course, to apply this to more complex channel models for which we do not know what the optimum solution is. Okay, but at least this example should show you that here we know that it converges essentially to the optimum um, solution. Okay, good. Now I go back to the um, slides. To go back to full screen, otherwise it won't work. Okay, should be now back to full screen. Good, okay. Um, by the way, if any one of you is interested, um, in my slides, there's a link here to a um, Google collaboratory Jupyter notebook. You can click on it and there's the entire code to reproduce um, essentially this example using a software library about which I speak in the last uh, couple of minutes or so. So you can just click on it and point to a website. You can run the same code, train the new network from this one. Okay, now I'm, um, the um, this is a nice concept, but it has um, many um, let's say shortcomings or problems that come with it. So um, in in theory, we know that um, channel capacity is an is an achievable rate. Uh, neural networks are universal um, function approximators, so they could should in principle be able to approximate the scheme and autocodant based communication should actually be capacity achieving. But the problem with this is that um, it suffers from exponential training um, and computational complexity. And the reason is now from the example that I showed to you, I just had four bits of um, input. But in practice, you would like to have, let's say, um, a thousand bits or 5,000 bits of input, meaning you have two to the power of 1,000 possible inputs. And um, if, you feed, if you use a simple, like an MLP um, or something like this, it just doesn't work at all because, you, you, because of the curse of um, dimensionality just explodes and it essentially doesn't work. And just here an example. So in the bottom, you see the bit error rate for, a, um, uh, for, for, a, for an LDPC code for various block lengths. And it shows you, you know, it as N, for example, if you have 128 bits, um, you have the top right. And if you have 16,000 bits, that's when you really reach channel capacity. And learning a scheme for such a long block length is actually not so trivial. I just have an example here. If you would use a simple MLP two hidden layer kind of structure for the um, transmit and receiver, um, where you have um, essentially twice the number of neurons as bits, uh, you have for a, a code of a length 16,000, I don't know how much is it, eight, 800 million of weights. And that's just totally elusive. You know, that, that's, that's crazy. It doesn't fit on any, uh, on any machine. And you can design actually um, um, an LDPC encoder that can run um, on a Raspberry Pi um, uh, with little complexity and achieves this power. So actually doing this brute force approach is not working. And um, so for this reason, uh, one needs to spend a lot of time choosing the right neural network architecture or combining neural network components and um, traditional algorithms. And I just wanted to mention here a couple of, of things. So um, um, there have been people um, that have invented a, um, a very nice architecture. It's called Turbo Autoencoders. I have a slide on, on this, I think, next. Um, people have leveraged um, deep CNNs for receivers um, that reduce um, complexity um, by, by a wide margin and improve performance. And you can also very nicely uh, mix these things. So for example, um, well, what we have done a lot in the past and we're still doing is we actually never tried to learn the channel code itself. So we just learn everything that's after the channel encoder and before the channel decoder, and then use this together with a, um, you know, a classic decoder because that's, that's typically much more efficient and also brings, brings a lot of gain. So we haven't seen a lot of gains for channel code, pure channel coding using, um, using neural networks yet. There has been some interesting work using graph neural networks for this, um, but still the complexity is, um, is too high to make it actually uh, worthwhile to be used in practice. Um, 
so I mentioned this turbo auto encoder idea. So this is um, something where, where, where people have, have managed to train auto encoders for fairly large block lengths up to a couple of hundred bits. And um, the key idea here is to, to leverage this turbo principle we have in communications. I'm not sure if um, many of you know this, but um, so the key idea is you have a vector of bits u that's coming in you feed this into a CNN and that produces you, you know, some symbols X1. But at the same time, you take a permutated version of this vector U that you feed into another CNN of the same structure, but with different weights. And you get another representation essentially of the same bits at X2. And these are concatenated and transmitted over the channel. And what you now do at the receiver side is that you have one CNN that looks at the first part and another one that looks at the second part but they exchange information between them. And this seems to work um, extremely, extremely well. Um, here's just, so if you have an idea, um, here's a block error rate versus SNR curve um, for a, um, for a, where you have a block length of, 100, of 64 bits that are encoded into 128 um, coded bits. Um, in, in black, so this black line is a theoretical approximation of what you should be able to, what, what could you ultimately achieve? Um, or it's a bound essentially, upper bound on what you can could achieve. Uh, in purple is kind of the best known scheme we have today that would be done by polar codes um, using um, essentially list decoding. You have a cyclic redundancy check on top. So that's what's used, for example, in, in 5G for very short um, control messages. And then you have LTE um, code from essentially that was used in, um, in, in 3G. And what's important now for us is you have this green dashed line that's the LTE um, turbo code. Um, and sorry, it's 4G. And um, then you have this essentially this turbo auto encoder in, in dashed line and it's fairly close. And it was kind of a breakthrough to be actually able to show that you can learn even such an an, an outer encoder for such a block length. Um, by now, I think you can do it even for, for longer code, but I think that actually was a fairly important breakthrough. Um, then I wanted to highlight something. So you can also, um, you do not only need, you cannot learn far more things. So we, we can learn um, codes, we can learn new new way to um, modulate um, bits uh, and so on, but you can also learn pulse shapes. So I haven't spoken about this. So in our chain representation, this Typically, you do not see it because that happens uh, essentially. It's part of the channel if you want. Um, but but typically, um, once you have your constellation symbols, these are mapped onto a pulse shape, and that actually determines the time domain signal that you send out over the air or over an optical fiber. And um, you can actually also learn these pulse shapes and also the receive uh, filters that you use for them. Um, into the entire end-to-end -end progress. So for example, you can you could optimize the, the mapping of bits to constellation symbols together with the transmit pulse and the receive filtering and an optimized um, receiver that maximizes this um, achievable rate. And you can optimize everything jointed together. And this allows you, for example, to have a very fine control on the spectral and also time domain characteristics of your signal. So for example, you can control uh, how, how confined your signal is in the spectral domain. So we have something called the adjacent channel leakage ratio. But typically you have an assigned bandwidth of say a 20 megahertz, and then you measure how much power leaks out of these 20 megahertz and you can minimize this, play around with this. Or it's um, often very important to look at the peak to, hour, peak to average power ratio. So meaning you would like to avoid high peaks in your signal because that makes your power amplifiers um, very inefficient. Because typically, as soon as you have very high peaks, your power amplifier would go into saturation. And this creates nonlinear distortions, which you'd like to minimize. And if you have a signal with a very, let's say, um, low peak to average power ratio, you can, opti you can operate your power amplifier at a much higher operating point so that it becomes more energy efficient. And so actually, by, by doing this end-to-end -end optimization, you could control these things for example, saying I want an ACLR of minus 45 dB um, and uh, a peak to average power ratio of something of a given uh, value or smaller than a given value. And under these constraints, I would like to maximize the rates that I can get across the system. These are the things you could do. So this works fairly nicely. Um, 
Now I would say after um, yeah five years working on on this, this topic, um, I haven't come across a single um, kind of component that cannot be learned with state of the art performance. Um, so we can now learn new codes, new modulation and piloting schemes. We can control the waveforms. Um, we have very powerful neural receiver um, that that outperform traditional methods. And they actually the key, you know, only if you have a neural receiver that is very strong, this allows you to optimize all the things at the transmitter. Um, so I would say the, the, the area where people do research nowadays on, I would say is mainly on MIMO detection, because there has been only little success so far. So coming up with a really good MIMO um, transmitter and, and receiver um, is an open problem. MIMO means you have a receiver with multiple antennas, that jointly tries to decode signals that have been sent by multiple transmitters with possibly multiple antennas. And um, so one key, it seems that self-attention and graph neural networks are very promising for this because they, these are the only ones that would be agnostic with respect to how many transmitters are there and things so that scale to very, you can use for a varying number of users and they do not depend on one precise choice of things. So this seems to work very nicely. Um, yeah, so I think I have um, 10 minutes left. I just wanted to mention something, um, an open source project on um, which I've been working on since I joined NVIDIA well, a bit more than a year ago. It's called um, Shona. And um, so, so Shona is a library for physical layer research. So for the type of research that I've um, also spoken about um, in this talk. And it's um, yeah, accelerated on GPUs. And it contains essentially all of the most important building blocks you need. So you have um, various channel coding schemes, different channel models, um, MIMO tr transmit, uh, receive algorithm, support for OFDM, and so on. And um, so the, the key is that this is written in TensorFlow based on and use, uses a lot Keras. And um, for example, the notebook um, that I've linked in, into these slides, this is also written, written in Shona. Um, and so um, the, I would say the most, the reason why we have done this is that we need these differentiable link lemma sim simulations. So um, whatever we do in order to do gradient-based optimization, we must be able to compute derivatives of all of the blocks we have. And so we essentially have written a link level simulator where all of the blocks, all of the algorithms are written in, 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 in TensorFlow and then wrapped as Keras layers. And um, this allows you to easily connect them together and also um, replace some components with neural networks. You know, you can have, say, I have a modulator, I have a coder, I'm a modulator, then I have a, a, a neural network, I have my channel, I have another neural network, and then I have my channel decoder. And I can optimize everything from end to end. Wherever I have trainable parameters, I can get gradients for them. And if not, it's also not a problem. And so it's really a differentiable link level simulator. Um, what's also important for us is since we run all the time very long Monte Carlo simulations to get these bit array curves, um, having this in TensorFlow is very nice because the first dimension is like in deep learning, it's always the, the batch size, so the number of Monte Carlo trials. And if you have a large GPU, you can run um, 10,000s of examples essentially in one batch and get these curves orders of magnitude faster than um, you, you, you were, you're used to. And um, to finish, I have here just a an hello world example to show you how this would look like. So um, imagine I would like to simulate a bit error rate curve for a 5G LDPC code um, using um, a 16 quam constellation, the one I mentioned earlier, 16 points on a, on a square. So we define a batch size, so the number of simultaneously transmitted code words. We define a code word length, the number of information bits per code word, a signal to noise ratio point. And then you have all of these components. You would create a constellation object, um, a binary source that generates essentially a tensor of random bits that you can then encode using a, um, for example, a 5G um, LDPC code. Once you have your coded bits U, you feed them into a mapper that maps this tensor of bits into a tensor of constellation points. You feed this through an AWGN channel with a given SNR. You have your D mapper that produces these up with these log likelihood ratios or a posteriori probability on your bits. 
And then you feed this into the channel decoder. And that's a couple of lines of code to generate such a, a curve. And um, now, for example, if you wanted to replace some things by trainable components, as I've done in this video. So you could simply say, I want to make the constellation trainable and you replace your classic D mapper by a neural network that I haven't defined here. And now you can compute gradient, do any type of optimization you want. And um, you can use it, it's on, 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 you can just install it using pip and it's ready, ready to be used. Um, yeah, uh, I've at the end here a couple of references um, if you're interested. And um, that's essentially um, what I wanted to speak about today. So um, I hope that was useful for some of you. Um, if you have any questions, uh, yeah, we have a couple of minutes, I guess. Yeah, thank you very much for this nice talk. Yeah, it's plenty of space for questions. Um, so thank you for the talk. Um, is the goal to create these receiver transmitter pairs for just general data transmissions, or would it also make sense to do it specifically for some data domain or task domain, like just images, because then I would imagine the neural network can find a better compression um, for if, if you know something about the distribution or some kind of like special purpose that's better receiver. Where is all of this general? Yeah. Um, I, I, I must say the voice quality was not stellar, so I, I only got a few bits, but I, I, I think I understood the um, uh, the questions, I think the question was, correct me if, it, if, it's, if, it's, if it's not correct, um, that if you want to do this for a specific purpose, so where you know something about, about if, if it's not just random bits that you want to communicate, but a specific type of data, for example, images or other sources of, of, of information. Um, if, if that's a question, then the answer is yes, and there has been work on this. So for example, you can skip totally this source coding part where you transform your data into binary representation. So for example, you could go directly feed an image into this neural network that transmitted. And for example, at the receiver side, you could either say, okay, I want to reconstruct the image, or you could even say, okay, I want to classify or do image segmentation or something like this. And you would train then everything from end to end with respect to one specific, um, say, data type and also application. You could simply integrate the transmission of information into the overall machine learning problem that you would like to solve. So essentially make the communication part, um, yeah, make communication a part of the machine, of the distributed machine learning problem you would like to solve. But was this roughly the question? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was exactly the question. So okay. is this doable in the physical layer like for future network generations um, to have, let's say, uh, if the data transmitted is an image, then use this neural network and otherwise use a different one and so on? Is this doable? Um, I mean, in, it's, it's doable, but the big problem uh, I see for now is that the current um, protocol stack we have would not allow you to do it because this just the image sits on your application layer and not on the physical layer. And you need to bypass essentially all many, many layers to actually tell um, the, the physical layer, please use the output of this neural network um, you know, to transmit, you know, that's what should be transmitted and you need to skip a lot of parts. And right now with the current protocol structure, it's just not possible to do such a thing. And um, so, and then the, the question is also, how much do you really gain by doing this end-to-end -end optimization? So um, there has been some work, but I think you get the lion's share of the gain purely on the application layer. So if you think about, for example, video compression, if you, if you skip this communication part and just learn a compression schemes using neural network, I think that's how you get state-of-the-art performance. And most likely you can use traditional approaches um, to get it with roughly the same performance. So I, I think it will be hard to justify why you would really like to do this in, in, in practice. So, but, but you could, but as I said, so there's a problem of protocols and standardization. I don't think there's any way you could do it right now. And the second part is really how, how big are the practical gains? And um, I, I, I think it's most likely get 90% without doing it.
Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Hoyt, thank you very much for the presentation. I think uh, for every PhD student that is working with machine learning communications, your papers are uh, a mandatory reading, okay? <laughs> Uh, and I have actually three questions, but maybe I will re resume in two questions. Uh, first question is, uh, did you assume that the Jacobian matrix was a, an identity matrix? When you were in the joint optimization? Um, so here, for this, what I've shown to you, the channel yeah. is an identity matrix and you add noise if you want. Yeah. So, but do you see some motivation to use another type of Jacobian or, or should we use for uh, all the time just an identity matrix? Oh, okay. No, so, so this thing is in, um, in, it really depends on, on what you do. For example, for this was just an example. So typically, these channel models are much more complex. So typically, you have here a convolution. If you actually interpret X is actually, so it's a, it's a vector, and you implement a convolution. With, you have a time varying channel impulse response. So your channel goes through a time varying channel impulse response. And um, that's something you generate with, um, um, you have many channel models you can use. And that's what's then used for training. So you actually do the end to end learning over an entire channel model. So on, on millions of different realizations um, of this channel model, because it's important that if you want to use this in practice, that you know your system cannot overfit to a single channel realization, but it should work under. Essentially, whatever it sees in practice, yeah. you see, could be optimized for this. Yeah, yeah because I, I have a, another way of thinking on this. Uh, in my point of view, we always should fix the Jacobian to be an identity. And all this generalization will come in the loss function, because in the forward propagation, you will collect all the difference uh, between the um, uh, the, dif dif the different likelihoods or different channel models, and the bad propagation comes just to learn uh, the encoder and the decoder part. So, in my point of view, since we are not learning any weight or parameter in the channel model, we should just fix it, uh, freeze the, this model, and pass the gradient like a uh, identity Jacobian. So, I didn't quite understand what is the benefit of adding more gradients. Uh, to, to this learning if we are not adapting the channel model itself. Okay, so um, this is a very simple example why this, I think this doesn't work. So um, for example, imagine your um, channel is not y equals x plus n, but it's y equals h times x plus n, and h is a random complex Rayleigh distributed essentially um, number, changes all the time. So um, if you would train your system on the identity matrix without taking this into account, you actually, your receiver and transmitter would not need to embed any type of pilot signals that would allow you to estimate H and compensate for it. And so um, in order so that your entire system actually accounts for this and say, hey, I need to learn a way to communicate over this channel that, that does a random scaling and phase rotation of my signal you must you must include this um, during training. So I don't see a way how you can can cannot do it. So um, I... okay. Yeah, just a little bit of fiber channel. And yeah. Today you can see the fibers with mine. Ah uh, yes. It's very different. Oh. It's very different. It's very different. So and I think for for optical fiber indeed, it would everything would be static. You could overfit to it. And I think I'm not an expert in optical communication, but most of the time it would mainly be about controlling these distortions you get um, in the fiber dealing with the, I don't know, Kerr effect and, and nonlinear distortion. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> because my, my second it, question was in, in this more or less direction of fiber, because I, I really like this idea of end-to-end -end learning. But if we have a, tra a transmitter in France and the receiver is in Italy, for example, we have one type of learning. But this transmitter will also be used to uh, transmit some information to Los Angeles in, in the US. So how I, I don't see how practically can we keep learning the transmitter side because in coherent transmission we already have some DSP blocks that learn and adapt the receiver side depending on where the transmission uh, is coming from. So uh, automatically this adaptation already happens in the DSP that is in the field. 
But for the transmitter side, as I said, if we use the same transmitter to uh, to come to uh, Italy or the US uh, from from France, this will uh, oblige us to keep learning the transmitter as well. And differently from training just the receiver, where we have all the information to do the, the training, let's say the regression training, for example, the supervised training, in the receiver we don't have actually the data uh, available easily from from the, the receiver side. So my, my only point is, what, what would be the possible solution? Because I, I don't see end-to-end -end learning as a flexible solution that will have a flexible application. It's just having the neural network in the receiver. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I, I... I must admit that I got 50% of... Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, I mean, uh, for the sake of time, I, I, I guess it was interesting what you said, but um, uh, I, I, I think I... I could, okay. A question or a comment? Could, otherwise, could you put it in one sentence? Yeah. So, this is the flexibility problem. So, uh, the same systems need to be retrained all the time. And training the receiver side is much more challenging than training the uh, sorry training the receiver side is much more easier to train than training the uh, transmitter side. So my question is about the flexibility. How do you see us training the transmitter side uh, in, in into a okay. Got it. Got it. Got, got the question. Yeah. Um, the thing is, I. I cannot really respond to optical communications because I'm, I'm I really don't know on which time scale these things change. So at least let me respond for wireless. So I don't think end-to-end -end learning where you would dynamically change something on the transmitter side is feasible because you spend all your budget and time on sending training signals and most likely it doesn't make sense. So what makes sense is uh, to train for a long time on channel models that are good fix the transmitter, and then what you can do is optimize on real data that you observe, um, optimize your receiver, but you would keep the transmitter fixed because I don't see this. It, it, it doesn't scale. It does. I think it doesn't work. It doesn't make a lot of sense um, in practice. I could imagine that for optical, it might be similar. That for example, you, op you, you learn maybe some new, some new waveform, some new pulse shape you use, but once you have data to collect, that that's really maybe <laughs> so I, I don't see a way how you can quickly dynamically update this. Yeah, I totally agree with you about this. Thank you. Uh, but uh, if we fix the transmitter side, uh, learning just the receiver would not be just as smart to have only one neural network in the receiver because then we can learn any sort of nonlinear uh, transfer function. But okay, thank you. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Thank you. Okay. Otherwise, if you have, if you want, just send me an email. Yeah, yes, thank you. <laughs> right. Okay, very last, super quick one. Yes, this is a thanks for the nice talk. So one quick question uh, about the augment model with the convolution neural network. So what would be kernel sizes and number of permutations you would need in this case? The short of, for the perception that it would need millions of parameters and for the convolutional approach. What would be the color of some of their size size? I sorry, I, I really don't I really don't understand. Do you have a microphone to which next so to I can try again? Okay. Uh, so for the convolutional uh, autoencoder, what would be the kernel size and number ah. of meters which are required in that case? Um so it really depends, but we typically try but to work with um depth-wise separable convolutions to keep complexity um, small. Kernels, I mean, we use often three by three convolutions um, and something between um, 64 to 256 um, different kernels. But it actually turned out that um, these, if you work with these three by three convolutions, what they learn is most of the time just some shifts. You know, essentially, they are ones and minus ones. And what they do is they just shift things in, you know, in nine possible directions you can probably even get rid of these totally um, and just use shifts and then the cost is very, very low. Was this is it roughly your question? Yes, perfect, thanks. <laughs> okay. okay, then I don't see any more questions, so let's thank Jacob again.
and thank you all for the discussion. Then we have now time for the coffee break, so which will be roughly half an hour. Well, let's come back at uh, quarter past, so we don't uh, shift too much. So 20 minutes, 20 minutes plus minutes. Yeah, yeah. So let's put it in line again. Everybody have a great, um, yeah, oh. great tool. Bye-bye.